you guys, DB Roy here, and you guys did say you guys wanted to be along the next time I do a self-defense session. Now, obviously, there's no one else with me, and pretty much most of my, well, by most I mean all of them, my self-defense sessions are solo, but I have quite a few drills that I think are very effective that anyone could train and learn alone and just be able to have those sort of strategies to better feel confident and keeping safe out there. As we know, Australia is quite mad at the moment with all these um, violent crimes running around, so sue me if I want to try to give something back. Now, you're probably wondering what actually is my background in fighting. Now, I did mention in the previous video that, yes, I had done a contact sport before. Now that contact sport was professional wrestling, and prior to, the, to that, I learned karate. So, you probably figured, ah, oh, great, he knows a non-contact sport and a fake one. Now, don't underestimate either of, um, those two sports. One of them is a traditional martial arts system that was um, designed for self-defense. And the um, other, professional wrestling, while, yes, I'll admit, yep, the match is scripted. There is actually a lot in professional wrestling that I find is actually very practical in self-defense. And I'll get more into that a bit later. So... So first, a little bit more about myself. Now, when I was a kid growing up in Baronia Heights, I was um, the skinny, small kid who was um, picked on all the time. I was um, verbally abused all the time, and kids used to set up ambushes in the toilets, and bottom line is, I, w I, I went through quite a lot of beatings until one day, um, opportunity came, knocked on the door when I was about nine. Um, he was um, talking to parents about signing their kids up for karate. You know how some of them come to the door like that? So, um, anyway, mum knew about the um, issues and me getting bullied and nothing was getting done about it. So, she signed me up, she signed me up for some karate lessons and while that did help my um, confidence a bit. Le learned um, how to punch, how to kick, the, the blocks and whatnot. And yes, it did actually help things in the matter of um, basic self-defense. Like I was beginning to be able to um, like use my kicks to keep people away and throw long distance strikes to keep people away. and. By then, a teacher would come in and break us up. Someone would run off and grab the teacher by then, something like that. And that kept me out of 50% of um, problems, but not problems outside of school. Like when you run into those same kids again, who, after all, they live in the same town, eventually, pretty much everyone knew everyone in Baronia Heights. Um, no one did not know who you were, basically. And, well, yes, and... Then I faced the problem with um, multiple attackers and um, them jumping me when I wasn't expecting it, when I wasn't in school. And that gave me the sur surprise of my life. And I started needing to have strategies on how to actually full on prevent these attacks. So I started working on awareness and prevention, you know. You know, if I see these kids, if, if I saw these kids coming at me again, if I had the option to run, if I had enough room to run, do it. Do it. If it's a closed off um, environment, I started realizing that in situations like that, because that's how they would often get me, they jumped me on unexpectedly and had me cornered, and I didn't have any strategies whatsoever to prevent that. Nor did karate um, teach those sort of scenarios. They didn't teach reality-based scenarios. 
unfortunately. A lot of um, a lot of their close quarter techniques are hidden in carders, and you sort of gotta experiment and work them out in order to uncover them. And you know those secrets were lost in the sands of time back when um, back when um, a lot of the um, secrets of karate were destroyed back in um, World War Two. It wasn't World War One. One of the two, anyway. So yeah, bottom line is, I was still getting jumped and beat up a lot until I started training my awareness and started f focusing more on recognizing the threat. And so, a lot of times, I was able to run away and sometimes these kids were faster than me and were caught up and some, and when that would happen, I would um, turn and face and go preemptive and that seemed to um, make things a lot better for me. Because well, when you're running when when you're running away from an attacker, they don't expect you to turn around and suddenly start fighting back. They're thinking, oh, we're gonna catch him, we're gonna pound him, we're gonna beat him. So while I was running, I would slip the back kick if I felt they were getting too close. And a lot of times, I would catch my attacker like that and still be able to run and be long gone before I got up. So that's when I started thinking of practical use for karate. The techniques were there, so how do we how do we um, make them a bit more practical? And so, from year ten, uh, not year ten, sorry, from year five, throughout um, pretty much my high school, I barely had to defend myself after after that point because I trained myself to get pretty good at recognizing my threats, recognizing how people move prior to an attack. And if they did move in an aggressive way, like, say, they're moving up, giving you attitude, and they're angling off like that, getting ready to throw that haymaker, I trained myself to recognize that, and if I had the um, opportunity to, to bolt, I would. And if I can't, like I said, like if, um, if I was like, about to be forced behind a wall or something, and I saw that, I would immediately go preemptive and start striking and striking in any way I could. So, in a weird way, I'm actually thankful that I took those meetings growing up. I'm thankful for the bullies because not only did it get me into a dojo and learning some martial arts and increasing my confidence, it also the beatings themselves actually showed me what worked and what didn't work and that I would have to adapt it to my more natural way of defending myself and I learned the hard way that if I let an aggressor and I would learn this when I was um, sparring in Kumite as well that whenever I let someone throw the first punch or the first strike, it's me trying to block and defend and moving against their flow, so to speak, while they're on the offensive. It's an uphill battle, in other words. Especially for me, who's not as quick. So, unfortunately, while teachers, society, and even senseis from the dojo would tell you They have to throw the first strike, otherwise it's not self-defense. You know, outdated thinking, misconception, and unfortunately, to, to someone who is um, slower on the defensive, that's, that's not exactly um, good advice. They're going to get creamed out there. So, okay, so I had to sort of ignore that part, and I would tell them, he he angled off to um strike me and they go oh how would you how do you know he was gonna strike because he angled off in a threatening manner he was he angled off he had his fist clenched like he was gonna throw throw a wild one but that didn't stop me from getting detentions and stuff from um whatnot because according to their thinking I threw the first punch therefore I'm the aggressor I'm guilty and I'm not sure if that still goes on today in schools and, and whatnot but it's it's outdated thinking, in my opinion. So, 
So yes, my self-defense style, more, more or less, is a preemptive one. And it's um, a style that I more or less follow today. So, now, in my high school life, um, from, t from when I was 12, I had this um, dream of wanting to wrestle professionally. Had no idea how to go about that, but I, I said to myself, that's what I wanted to do when I got older, once I left school. And, um, well, now I wasn't the best student in school, and um, te teachers, quite frankly, didn't have time for me, and this was including in the special education program. Yes, I was in the special education program. Nothing to be ashamed of. And, um, yeah, and um, I even told them about this. They didn't seem interested in wanting to help me achieve that, wanting to be a professional wrestler. You know, they kept, um, they kept me on things that um, I wasn't getting or um, couldn't do, couldn't work out for the life of me. And, um, well, I could admit that I could have gone down a very bad road here with um, teachers, you know, treating a student like that. And I think that still goes on today. You know, they like, they like focus on the ones who are really doing well, while the other ones get sort of left behind, the ones that really need help sort of get left behind. It doesn't matter if you put them in a special education unit program, the same thing still happens. Anyway, so... I actually spent my time in school figuring out, okay, how can I make this pro wrestling dream um, happening? So, how can I how can I achieve that? So, whenever whenever school would let me on the computer, I was looking up pro wrestling organizations in Australia. There was not as many of them around today as there are now. You know, there was one in Gold Coast called MIW, which would later be called IPW Australia. And so we, we watched that like glue. And one day when the site was taken down, I remember freaking out because like, oh no, did it go out of business? And we didn't realize that um, we now had IPW Australia, which was basically the same company. Just renamed and I, I thought I, I mistaked it for the IPW New Zealand branch. So it took, it took me a while to um, realize that, and so I did other things as well as to, during my school time, to um, think how I was going to do that. I was um, riding down um, bus routes and things to get to this place. I was um, hitting the school gym whenever I, whenever I could, lifting weights, um, hitting the bag, keep you know, getting my, keeping myself in that fighting spirit, so to speak, and um, my, my friends would constantly, we'd constantly spar, at each, spar each other and play wrestle and things like that. Anything that got me thinking towards professional wrestling. Well, like I was manifesting, you know, law attraction, that sort of thing, if you, if you believe in that. But yeah, essentially the same thing, but in my own way, I was working towards it. And after I graduated six months later, I began training at um, IPW. And it was actually there, I got um, quite a big surpri biggest surprise of my life. Because, um, you know, you, you, hear, you hear it all the time from people outside the world of professional wrestling. Uh, it's just fake. They don't really hurt each other. They're not really getting hurt, yada, yada. So, um, unfortunately, because of that and all that talk, I underestimated that when I um, started training. And um, when I started taking um, hits from um, other professional wrestlers, the punches they do, pu they, anyway, they surprisingly sting. They, they surprisingly sting a bit. Mind you, not as bad as if you're um, you're boxing or um, in a real f or in a real self-defense situation or, or nothing like that. But this is me getting to the point where uh, professional wrestling actually helped improve my self-defense because, like, 
let's let's think of the first move in professional wrestling. Like they're circling each other a little bit, and the first thing you see is professional wrestlers do a lock up. They come in, left hand goes somewhere behind the head, and this one locks with the elbow. It's all about it's all about entering, which is um, so, which is um, which was one of my weak points in self defense. Actually, finding the commitment to enter. And thanks to professional wrestling, it actually um, taught me that. Even sometimes when you're you're working the spot in the corner, and um, you get us a you get us a your, your opponent gives you a surprise shot, even though it's not hurting much, you still sort of react to it and whatnot, but yet you're still going to keep going and still work in that corner. So the good thing about this is that it got me used to getting hit. It got me used to getting hit and got me used to looking like I was really going on the offensive, which brought a bit more realism to my matches, I found. And it also... Like I said, helped me out a lot with um, my self-defense. So, um, like for example, like let, let's take the lockup. Let's take the, the lockup again. How can we practically use that in a self-defense situation? And so now, my first move, like if if I'm faced with my attacker, all right. So you, you notice my hands always come up like this, like in a passive way. Or my hands might be up here because usually when I go walk around, I got the backpack on. So second guy, guy's getting in my attitude, he's done uh, mouth off on my face, whatnot. My hands are coming up here, and I'm also moving a bit to the side while I'm trying to talk down. Now the reason I do this, it makes it makes it harder for an aggressor to set up that first shot. I'm talking. Uh, I'm talking. I'm moving. I'm keeping out of his line of fire. Meanwhile, he's still in the he's still in my line of fire. He's still in my line of fire because I can still go into the face to do basically whatever I want, no matter how I move. And as I'm talking to him, I'm watching his body language. Is he angling off? Is he trying to conceal his hands? Whatever it is, so. Now, if we look up, look at the, now, a lockup is a lockup. That's how you look at it. But, it's also a good way to enter and get that first strike. So, let's say, this is why the dog leash is here. Let's say that this is my attacker's arm. Alright, so, I'm here. I'm here, I'm verbally diffusing. I'm here verbally diffusing, I'm moving, moving the side, making sure, moving back into the side, making sure he can't set up that shot. Okay, and suddenly, he wants to go for it. Bang. Now essentially, that's the same technique as doing the lockup, as doing the lockup. The difference is, I'm on the inside of his arms. One arm's out here, the other arm is God knows where, and rather than locking up the arm and just clenching the head. The difference is, is that I'm striking, clenching the, I'm striking with this hand, clen then clenching the back of his head, and coming in immediately with this one. And essentially, it's virtually the same technique. Now, a couple of years, uh, about eight years back, I was, um, I was working at um, a Hungry Jack store at the time, or as you Americans might call, Burger King. And um, I had to um, commute two hours to and from my job, so four hours of my day. And that's because um, yeah, I couldn't get a transfer order to, I couldn't get a transfer to a store on the Gold Coast for some reason. Because I was too old, I cost too much, fair enough. And so, um, one day, I was coming home, now, usually, I would take um, the shortcut to the train station that cut through this um, small park in an alleyway, 
And uh, what happened on, on this day is I was uh, walking through and these two teenagers were um, sitting at the table. Now the second I was um, coming in and walking by, they got up and started blocking my exits. And they were walking like they had um, a bad, a bad attitude. So yeah, so they, they walked up and they immediately blocked my exits. And then one of them began threatening me. He, he was saying some stupid crap about how he was gonna gut me like a pig. Now the second I heard the word gut, gut equals knife. This is my awareness kicking in. The first thing I did instinctively was that. Straight up. He was he got he got that close to me when he, when he was blocking my exit, he was that close to me. His um friend was um further back. So in this case, I was standing like this where I could watch both of them. I knew the other guy was further away. And this guy is um mouthing off, he's talking about gutton. He made a threatening gesture like he was actually going for it, so I immediately went in and shut him down with that. And that is essentially the same as a lockup. Same as a lockup, but rather than tying up his arms and head, I'm just using that to make sure he doesn't throw a haymaker so I can get that first strike and clinch and come in. I struck him in the head with the blade of my arm, and it was enough to knock him down and I simply bolted to the train station. So, so basically, you guys watching this, your um, self-defense homework is to um, take a walk. Get those earphones out of your ear, get those eyes out of the video screen, take a walk, and have a good look around, around at the world around you. For starters, nice and fun thing to do. And um, you'll notice the more you do that, the more your um, you'll start training up your awareness and you'll start noticing abnormalities such as um, people walking up to you with an attitude for example and maybe an angry drunk walking a bit like like this like he's had a few and he's angry and yelling at passerbyers and things like that you wouldn't go near him would you? you would take a safer route home you know and it's um that awareness and, ki and basic instinct that is your first line of defense before anything becomes um, violent and 90% of times you can actually avoid violent confrontations simply by being aware of what's going on around you recognizing that threat, threat and avoiding it altogether 80 to 90% of the time the other 10% of the time he might be getting your awareness might have been a little bit down and he's getting in your face, he's, um, if this is my opponent's arm and I'm moving back to the side now, what? see how my, that, that'll be a separate drill, drill. but let's um, s simulate that this hand, see how it's moving with mine, this is actually a pretty good drill to practice, because this gets you into the habit of, um, following your aggressor's arm, where he moves. So if I'm talking, and he's moving his arms around like he's trying to touch me, see how my arm's going up and down and following, and my other arm's doing the same? Same thing, my arms are following him. So if he's doing that and he's um, reaching back, my head's gonna come down, I'm gonna strike and trap him before he pulls a weapon or something like that. That's why it's important to also develop that. I'm glad I spotted that when I was doing this. So, see, very, very handy tool. This is just a dog leash tied around poles, simulating an attacker's arm. So, so again, I'm here. I'm verbally diffusing. I'm moving to the side, moving as much as I can, so he can't set up that shot. And meanwhile, he goes and makes an aggressive move I don't like. I can immediately come in. And look, wrestling skill right there, I just got behind him, established ch chest to back, get out of his power and striking range and whatnot. That's what this is really good for handy, being handy for good, good at teaching you, good at teaching you how to enter, 
and gets you really good at watching where, where your aggressor's arm's going. And of course, I can't strike a noob from all over here. Probably for a little, yeah, I can throw a little overload kick, no problem. So, if I'm actually beyond his reach when he's um, angling off, I'm probably going to throw the low line kick and keep him and keep him that way. Throw a low line kick and then come in and enter. So, so another so another drill you can do is um, grab hold, grab hold of an arm. Um, got your aggressor in front of you. Um, moving your palm them down like you're like you're tracking this one. Doing the same with this one. Um, you're verbal, trying to verbally diffuse, and just when you're visualizing your breast is going angling off like this, or doing this, or or any other sort of aggressive move, maybe this shit. Come on, then. You'd be striking. Yep. So, so yep. here we are, here we are, here we are. Press the move! <laughs> so, yeah. Mm. Now, some of the other things that professional wrestling helped me, especially in terms of self-defense, was my striking capability. Now, you see these strikes in um, pro wrestling all the time when they go to them, like, for example, when they go in the corner, they're doing, they're doing these sort of ones, um, how they kick the crap out of someone in the corner, that sort of thing, um, elbow strikes like this, oh! Oh! you know what, we close on too. Yeah, I'm bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we've all watched WWE before, and all these are strikes that you can use in a practical situation if you tweak them a little bit. Because I was actually the first, the first one I was doing the um, self defense way. In pro wrestling, they use this part so it doesn't hurt you as much, and you you sell it. They do that, and they usually hit you around here on the chest, but it's that close, it looks like it's hitting you in the face. And, um, but realistically, in a self-defense situation, this strike is meant for the face, and you'd be striking with this part. So, if I'm in a self-defense situation, now, you'll, no you'll notice that I favor these open hand techniques. That's so I can strike and clinch at the same time. If I'm closing my hands and doing this, it sort of limits me. It sort of limits me and limits you, and you're wasting more time having to open your hand and then having to clinch. And by then, you can duck out the way. But if I'm striking and following through, I can strike and clinch at the same time, like that. Like, a, like I was showing you when I was showing you how you can use a, a a pro wrestling lockup is a way of striking. Again, show you it again. Um, where was I? <laughs> I had a point I was trying to make. So, yeah, I'll just explain that. Yes, 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 pro wrestling and strikes. That's it. So, so yes, yeah, so in a self defense situation, I might go with a um, faster option, bang, and then I'm coming in with that. It's the same as in pro wrestling, they're in the corner, they wind back, and boom, but they're hitting with this. Instead, I'm hitting with that. And to make sure that when I use it in a self defense situation, I'm not telegraphing it. So I'm here, so bump, bump. See, I'm using the hip, and this is coming straight out really quick. It's, 
it says less telegraphic as so I can. And of course, I can swing all the way around, and it's an elbow. And same, if I'm going to go up with the elbow, it's going to go straight up. I've got my attacker, he's looking at me, he's looking at me here. Chances are, I'll do this, he's not going to see it. Same with any strike, I go here and go into his face, second hand goes off, does a threatening move, and I go. See how quick that is? So. Yes, so, so another drill you can do, so is with, with the rope, start doing on this and start working on those preemptive strikes, start visualizing your attacker is making that aggressive angle off, or he's going for something, or another common one, he's turning his back behind you and trying to come at you like that, very sneaky one. There's no reason for someone to be getting in your face and turning his back on you unless he's trying to get you into a false sense of security and try and whack you like that. Or um, false sense turns his back and then suddenly he's got a knife on you. So yes. So yes, he's getting greedy, getting mad and he t t turns to me like this I would also be striking. Very important. It's a sneak. It's a sneaky trick. No different than if I'm running away from an aggressor and he starts catching up to me, I slip a back kick. So yep, let's do that. So visualization, aggressive move, entering and striking. Um, I'm not saying whack a pole, by the way. I'm not saying you have to whack a pole. You, you, use a punching bag. I don't have a punching bag, so this is my option, striking a pole. So, and if you are going to strike a pole, don't punch. Whatever you do, don't punch. I highly recommend, even in self-defense situations, use your open hands, less chance of injuring yourself. Let's say I punch my aggressor, and he's able to duck it in some way and I end up whacking his chin or a harder part of his head, you can end up busting your knuckles and breaking it, needing surgery to fix it, and you can't use this hand to defend yourself anymore. But by palming, there's less chance of an injury like that. So, so, so yep. Don't be afraid to let, let this rope sort of tag you a little bit, like, like he's actually trying to make physical contact. Sometimes I like to do this while closing my eyes. I feel that. I'm moving like he's trying to grab onto me or he's shoving me. Same thing. And then I'll be coming in. Anywhere I can, anywhere where I can. So that is a pretty good drill to actually run. If you're, if you're going to make believe that you're backing up into a wall, you're going to do a little like kick, kick there like you're whacking over the nuts. That's what I'd use, um, a kick in the nuts. If he's trying, if I got an aggressor and they're moving me behind the wall, that's when I use this as a preemptive strike. And then enter and try to use him as a pivot and try to find an opening escape. After all, multiple attackers. In um, every self-defense situation I've ever been in, I have not once gone one on one with someone. There's always been, he's always had, they've always had friends with him. Sometimes it's one on one, three on one. I've um, been five on one before, and um, you know, it's crazy. It's crazy. Well, anyway, for, um, for today, I'm about done with my um, self defense solar drills for today. So now I'm going to switch off here and do the rest of it, just some basic cardio. So 
might be some incline push-ups and um, some jogging and some sprints just to make sure that I am keeping myself fit and that I'm still able to move quick. That's, that's what I'm doing when I'm training cardio. I'm not training to, to, loo to, to lose weight. I actually find a lot of people stay away from me because of my size. But I also want to make sure that if I ever have to defend myself again, that when, when the situation is done, I can make my getaway. So it's important to train up that endurance and train up that endurance and keep a, a level of conditioning going. And well, hey, and if I actually do lose weight and turn my body up, <laughs> again, well, happy accident. So, anyway guys, thank you for joining me for this video and for joining me for this long. I hope you guys enjoyed it. It was um, a lot of fun making it. I had a lot of fun showing you guys this drill. And like I said, um, first drill, um, start walking around and start looking at the world around you. Start training up that awareness so you always know what's going on around you. you I can't stress this enough, you can't do that if your ears are plugged into to music on your on your iPhones and you're watching videos on your iPhones and your heads are on the screen. You're killing 90% of your awareness skills right there. And quite, fr quite frankly, you're just asking to be jumped. I should know, um, 2008 I was actually jumped like that. My, fir my first self-defense experience as, a, as an adult, I was uh, walking around in the my ears, didn't hear the guy behind me. He uh, slammed me straight into a wall and took my wallet. Now, I'm lucky, I'm lucky I felt the push and was able to get my hands up and save myself, thanks to um, progressing training. That's another good thing, yeah. Because, yeah, they teach you something that's called a bump and teaching you like when they get slammed the walls, you notice they get their hands in front. That has um, saved my life so many times. Not just um, because some guy's trying to beat me up, even even when I've taken slips when I was um, working at Burger King, you know, I would, I would full on take a pro wrestling bump on the um, floor and get up fine. Anyway, so, so, so I was lucky I had that um, pro wrestler's instance to get my hands up so I wouldn't hit my head against the wall and um, you know bleed out or anything like that. But by the time I got back up, the wallet's gone. He's run. He's ran off half a mile. And um, yeah, I've never made the mistake of um, listening to MP3 songs while walking ever again. And um, so that's going to be it for now. Um, for my next videos. If you guys like, I might do more of a video on striking and show, show you a bit more about striking. Or if you if you can't wait for that, I do recommend you look up Code Red Defense, taught by Nick Drosos. He is where I've got all these um, reality-based self-defense strategies from. So I recommend checking him out because he can explain it a hell of a lot better than I can, and you'll learn a lot more. It'll it'll change your life. Trust me. Anyway, this is DB Rice signing off, and I will see you guys next time for um, maybe another one of these videos or my next Dragon Ball What If video, whichever comes first. Alright, catch us later.